Another day, another recap. Today we'll be diving into an action thriller movie titled The Gunman. There will be some spoilers ahead and as always enjoy the recap. In 2006 a civil war wreaks havoc in the Democratic Republic of Congo or DRC because of an ongoing power struggle between several multinational mining companies wanting to prove their dominion over the local industry. Suddenly one day, the country's Minister of Mining and Natural Resources announces the cancellation and renegotiation of contracts with all foreign mining companies. Under such circumstances, Jim Terrier is a black ops mercenary deployed in the country under the cover of providing security to local projects. While he is on site at the airstrip one night, his partner Annie works as a doctor at an NGO where she declines a co-worker, Felix Marty's offer to drop her home and decides to wait for Jim. With that, an operation begins with Jim and his team to execute the minister. The shooting team consisting of Reed and Bryson in addition to Jim is assigned their roles and respective positions by their leader, Terence Cox. He also informs them that their supervisor, Felix, will be the one to decide who among them engages with their target in the minuscule five-second window to take their shot. Additionally, they learn that Felix has made immediate extraction preparations for the chosen shooter. Soon after, Jim takes up his designated position in a hotel room as he puts together his sniper rifle. A while later, Felix contacts him to let him know that he has been chosen to take the shot at the minister. Realizing that he will be fleeing the country soon, Jim requests Felix to keep an eye on Annie in his absence. With the operation officially underway, he quite easily delivers his shot and takes his leave. On the other hand, the country faces the consequences of the assassination in the form of widespread riots and destruction. Jim is back in Congo eight years later as a humanitarian relief worker. He accompanies Eugene one morning to the village where they were assigned to build a well. While they are at work a gang suddenly arrives at the village looking specifically for Jim. Once he is spotted, he tries telling them that he meant no harm and only intended to get the village some clean water, but he is attacked nonetheless. Not only does he put up a strong fight using all his expertise, but he also uses their weapon to take them down. Saving Jim from being attacked, Eugene shoots one of the gang members and is shocked by his own actions. Searching his attacker, Jim then finds evidence that this attack was meant only for him. Expressing his gratitude, he attempts to convince Eugene that he did the right thing and proceeds to instruct him further about stopping all of their operations for the safety of everyone in the organization. Returning to his hotel room in Kinshasa, he is haunted by his memories of the night of the assassination and decides to immediately leave the country. Arriving in London, he gets to his residence and goes through his notes about the time he spent in Congo all those years ago. He then meets his former colleague, Terence, and informs him about the attack he faced recently. Terence tells him that apart from their team, only the clients who hired them knew about the operation which possibly included politicians and a few mining corporations. He adds that Felix was the only one in contact with the clients and suggests that if Jim thinks this attack was in any way connected to the assassination, they should just track him down to know for sure. He says that he might be in Barcelona and offers to get in touch with Reed and Bryson as well to alert them just in case the rest of the team is attacked next. As Jim leaves the building though, he notices he has multiple tails and is being closely monitored by an unknown group. Sensing being followed, he loses his tail and manages to discreetly find his way to a bar to meet a friend named Stanley. Filling him in about the attack, he says that someone had ordered the attack and had expected to receive 50 CCS of evidence of his end. He also says that he needs to know who was behind the attack before they make another attempt on his life. When they are interrupted by a drunkard, Jim gets in a bar fight and Stanley quickly gets him out of there only to realize that his friend is taken over by a sudden spell of severe dizziness. He gets him tested soon after and the diagnosis turns out to be cumulative head trauma due to post-concussion syndrome. Considering that there wasn't any specific treatment available, the doctor suggests Jim to stay away from stressful situations of any kind to avoid worsening the condition. Despite his diagnosis, Jim insists that he has to meet Felix in Barcelona, and convinces a reluctant Stanley to help him out with arrangements. With Jim's health at risk, Stanley even promises to join him there in case he needs him. Once in Barcelona, Jim gets to the safe house arranged by Stanley's contacts and finds the gun and ammunition left there for him. He tracks Felix later and finds Annie with him. Following her through the city he arrives at an international adoption agency. What he doesn't know though, is that he was followed as well. A while later, Jim is attending a seminar where Felix is one of the speakers. He makes his presence known to Felix who is visibly disturbed upon seeing his old friend there. The two meet after the seminar ends and Jim learns that Felix and Annie are now married. Felix promises to try and find out anything he can about the attack before inviting him over for dinner with him and Annie. Unable to deny a chance of meeting her, Jim heads over to a restaurant that night and she is shocked to see him there. As it turns out, Felix never told her about meeting Jim and inviting him over, so it could be a surprise for her as well. 
However, she is rightfully uncomfortable to see Jim after all this time, especially since she is now married. Felix tries to make matters worse by announcing their adoption plans, which causes Annie even more anger, and Jim steps in to shove Felix away. Embarrassed, Annie storms out of the restaurant and Jim follows her. After catching up to her, he apologizes for suddenly returning to her life and informs her of his address in case Felix still wants to share any information he may have found about the attack. Annie simply rushes away angrily. The following day, Jim is invited by Felix and his wife to have some lunch. He promptly drives over to their countryside place, and a somewhat drunk Jim informs him that his doubt could be right about the recent attack being connected to the assassination. He repeatedly ignores an incoming call and then proceeds to tell Jim that they are all on a congressional subpoena list and hence on Interpol's radar regarding the event in Congo in 2006. When Jim sees Terence's name on the list, he wonders why Reed and Bryson were not mentioned, only for Felix to tell him that among the team of three shooters, Jim is the only one remaining alive now. Realizing the threat to his life, Jim then announces that he has invited Stanley over, and Felix begins to behave strangely before excusing himself. Jim follows him and grabs his phone to check his messages, correctly anticipating that Felix is feeding information to someone. Finding Annie in their bedroom, he clarifies that he was lying about inviting Stanley and adds that what Felix did instead was going to get them all in trouble. Almost immediately, he notices the place being surrounded and pulls Annie to get down even as Felix refuses to understand the severity of the situation. Jim saves him from getting hit once but as drunk as he is he lets himself get hit soon after. A thoroughly disturbed Annie then follows Jim's instructions and stays close as they cautiously make their way through the place to avoid the mercenary team already making their way in. Silently hiding in the wine cellar, Jim attacks the first guy that gets there, and Annie disturbingly watches as he calmly borrows his vest weapon and the team's communication device as well. As the team outside goes through the workers at the place, Jim's assassin's instincts kick in and he begins his attack, however he is chased down by some more gunmen and is forced to run and take cover in a bathroom. The mercenaries blast at the door with multiple bullets until they stop and call out Jim. On their comlinks the mercenaries send units to the skylight, the mercenary outside offers to save Annie's life if he gives himself up but Jim refuses to do so. The men then quite cleverly set the bathroom ablaze in order to open the skylight. However Jim knows there is a man there and kills him while breaking the skylight. Using his corpse, Jim runs through the burning door and chucks a grenade before running back to Annie. The explosion stuns both the men while the duo run out of the bathroom. They immediately get into a car and speed off only to throw a grenade into the enemy vehicle and be shot at. The car exploding rocks the mercenaries long enough so that both Jim and Annie can escape without any pursuers. A while later, Annie directs him to a farmer friend's shed to borrow his car, even as she tries to ask him for information. Giving in, he finally tells her that laying the airstrip and providing security at Congo was just a cover for actually supplying weapons to the rebels, and that Felix was their middleman. She also compels him to confess his responsibility for the minister's assassination because of which he had to leave the continent. He says that he wasn't able to return for a while and that he tried his best to contact her but Felix always got in the way and assured him that she was fine. Once they reach his place, he instructs her to drive around the block for 15 minutes and also tells her to leave him if she doesn't find him later. Carefully entering his apartment from a window, he gathers his belongings and then notices a tripwire installed at the front door attached to an explosive. Crawling through the space he spots someone in the apartment across the street and then disengages the tripwire. Wanting to fool his attackers, he then walks to the front of his building ensuring they see him returning home and safely opens the door to his apartment. Knowing that this will tempt them to come over and check, Jim re-engages the tripwire. A massive explosion occurs the moment the door is opened, thereby ending his attackers while he safely gets downstairs to join Annie. Meeting Stanley at another safe house, Jim learns that an organization pretending to be an international trading company is responsible for his attacks and that it is managed by Terence. With a huge upcoming deal, the company is attempting to clear its tracks from anything in the past that can potentially harm its future. Stanley also brings attention to the fact that Annie's life is now in danger since Felix has been executed. Early the next morning Jim leaves a heartfelt note for Annie and bids Stanley goodbye as well before leaving on his own. Outside Terence's office building in Gibraltar, he meets Interpol agent Jackie Barnes. Informing him about an Interpol raid on the company, Jackie leaves his contact details with Jim before going his way. Spotting Terence on his way out a while later, Jim then leaves a message for him saying that he had an hour to get to the aquarium and meet him. Later, barely managing to deal with the trauma of his head injury, he asks Terence what can be done to make things right. Even as Terence's team try to locate him, he replies that Jim simply had to go since he is the last person alive who knows about the past. Jim continues to struggle as Terence goes on mocking him in an attempt to buy time for his team to reach him. When Jim tells him that he has information on everything they did in Congo, Terence is compelled to insinuate that Annie was at risk when he abandoned her. 
Jim shoots at Terence even as he insists that taking him out will not end his troubles since there will always be someone else looking to end his life. Terence's team finally gets there, and Jim makes a run for it, all the while continuously shooting at them and trying not to get hit himself. In his hurry to get away though, he unknowingly drops his diary. With a massive headache his message to Stanley asking him to stay alert sadly remains unsent as he collapses. Gaining consciousness later that night, he immediately calls Stanley only to be greeted by Terence. He is told that while Stanley is bound and thoroughly beaten up he has managed to stay loyal to Jim, and even Annie has not been spared. When Stanley asks Jim to finish Terence, he is promptly shot in the head. Terence then tells Jim that his diary led them to find the place and then offers Annie's life in return for his, using a video showing Terence assigning them their roles for the operation in addition to his other diaries as leverage. Jim gets him to meet him with Annie at a bullfight in the city the next day. When the time finally comes around, Jim decides to give a call to Jackie Barnes and asks for his help. Terence and his crew get jumpy, and Jim calls Terence to demand that Annie be sent out of the stadium, and then they'll receive the video he has. Problematically, they spot him and go to intercept him in the gallery. He quickly loses them behind a wall, and when one of the men approach him he is quickly neutralized. They grapple for some time until Jim finishes him off. On the move again, another henchman chases him and has his gun on the ready. Jim then opens up some gates to release a few bulls and a gunfight ensues where Jim is millimeters away from getting hit. He then uses his surroundings to pin his attacker and as they both fire away, the enemy is killed, and Jim was also shot. This added on top of his already worsening condition doesn't help him. Nonetheless another enemy approaches as he attempts to patch himself up. Once Terence hears his men are lying dead, he quickly gets up to leave with Annie. When he is distracted though, Annie makes a run for it through the crowd and Terence attempts to keep up with her. Jim in the meantime gets shot from behind and a massive firefight takes place between Jim and Terence's last surviving man. It quickly turns into a hand-to-hand -hand combat with both men giving it their all, however, not looking too good for Jim, he manages to turn it around and repeatedly injure his attacker. Annie then decides to jump the rails and sprint while Terence uses his gun to get closer to her. Back to the two men giving it their all, Jim is about to lose his life when he barely manages to kill his opponent. He then tosses his body off the rails which lets a bull loose. After running around the place, Annie spots Jim and Terence holds a gun at her and wants the documents. As Terence gradually moves forward, Jim's blurred vision is still enough to put a couple bullets into him. As Annie gets up, a door opens for the bull to come rushing over, and it does not hesitate to run over and finally put an end to Terence. Almost instantly, multiple armed police officers race in and split both Jim and Annie apart. At the hospital a while later, Jim promises to cooperate with the Interpol's investigation, which eventually leads to the arrest of the CEO of the globally largest mining organization for involvement in the assassination. With time, Jim is eventually released from prison, and he gets back to Congo to finally reunite with Annie. The end.